Hello everybody, this is Dawn. Um, I am dog sitting this weekend, so you may see the dogs that I'm taking care of. Um, but um, I'm just here to, for a quick update, <laughs> this is Peanut, um, for a quick update and then I would like to um, share something that um, was laid on my heart in terms, uh, I am going to read from the scripture and talk a little bit about the resurrection. Um, as um, preparatory for what I'll be talking about in a few weeks with the ascension of Jesus. Um, I believe that um, that what we are doing here um, in this journey that we are opening up for all of humanity, we are doing this as a model for all of humanity to follow. And I believe the first model was Jesus, um, the Christ, who sits at the right hand of God the Father, as it says in the Bible, and who was with God from the foundation of the world. That is my belief, um, and it is a belief that I find um, absolutely consistent with my own experience um, on this journey. So I'll be talking more about that. So in a moment, I'll go into that. First, just the quick update, and for those of you who just want to hear the quick update um, on where we are, that's great too. So um, yesterday, I posted a video of a, a poem and a painting um, I did. This is, you know, quite... Um, it was basically the chains that are around um, us that we must release so that we can free ourselves um, and in that freedom uh, reclaim the wholeness of who we are and then um, the radiant realization of who we are and allow that to come forward um, in our lives and to allow it to open up the way for, <laughs> hello, uh, to open up the way for um the way forward in terms of our uh, what we're here to do for the way that we're here to serve um, in a particular way, each one of us. Um, so that uh, unshackling is critical, and it feels um, feels very much like um, a lot was happening yesterday. That was the sixth of May, and today is the seventh of May. It is Sunday, and. Um, Last night, uh, from from myself in dream time, there's a, a lot of a lot of stuff coming through, um, per, both personally and collectively, and uh, you know, honestly, it felt like cosmically an awful lot um, was being reordered and um, and shifted. Peanut, can you sit over here? Thank you. Okay. All right. No, he's gonna stay right with me. You're gonna listen. Okay. Um, and so, um, a lot was happening, and. Um, one of the things I wanted to speak to um, was that it was sort of shown something um, that was on a, that gave me a new level of understanding. So many of us have core wounds that are still um, the final um, bits for many of us are being released and or cleared, so to make way for um, you know divine love and to also make la make way for um, the <laughs> okay sweetheart. Uh, um, to make way for the um, the work that we're here to do. I'm sorry, I'm so distracted. Okay, so um, one of the things that came up that I was shown that was different, thank you, um, was that um, some of the core wounds that we've experienced, we've been aware of the, the um, our own internal wounding, but what we haven't necessarily seen is how that relates to um, the collective. And also how any any one given core wound. So, for example, I'll just be I'll just use one for an example that um, I continue to clear, which is the kind of the mother wound um, and the feeling of um, the feeling or experience of um, pain, loss, rejection around that abandonment, even in some cases. Um, and uh, just to be clear, my, my own mother did not abandon me or anything like that. But there are, you know, there's a stream that we all have to heal. And so what I was uh, seeing very clearly last night was how that relates to so many um, experiences in this life that I've had. It, it relates in ways that are somewhat unexpected to um, to larger than this life wounding and and how that relates to the collective and how it shows up. So um, it's it's as if like um, we done we, some of us have done the work to heal um, a specific uh, wound. Are you hearing this too? Yeah. Um, and that uh, we've done the work to heal a specific wounding and um, and yeah we haven't seen um, just how the the outer edges of that wound um, and where that has led and where it's been either um, touched or replicated and then the um, 
what has come from that um, is all being cleared. So it's like the um, it's like there were still some um, some uh, tentacles that reached out from that core wound that um, that we hadn't seen the connections uh, to, or we had not um, understood that the healing actually can transmute, it can travel down those tentacles and transmute all. And that's what was happening um, for me um, personally. And it was just really powerful. And so I feel like we can um, be even more proactive with that and um, you know, consider a particular core wound and then see that healing that, um, that some of us have done a lot of, um, see that healing flooding out through the channels and all of the, I call them tentacles, I think there's a better word, um, but through those pathways and um, through time and space and to all people um, and to all those who, for whom our mirroring of that wound when, as we've gone through our healing process has been very difficult for them to see. And so there has been, you know, perhaps an, a, further rejection um, because they don't want to see that in their own um, experience or in the collective. Um, and the, the exposure, the revelation of uh, the truth, right? The exposure um, itself can be very uh, traumatic for, um, for many. And we probably remember that from the first time that we touched that pain. And so um, as a result, there is this tendency to uh, continue to, you know, to um, subconsciously um, to push it away or not see it or distance ourselves from uh, from others. And, and that can happen where we're the ones doing that and where it is um, it is occurring in our lives. So just something to be aware of. Um, and then uh, other thing that was uh, very, very amazing um, was a lot of, um, a lot of love, a lot of love is underneath this whole process love from um the cosmic realms and that are just celebrating us right now and um pouring out pouring out their blessings and love and strength and um and then also you know there there is a um flowering of the love between each um divine pairing that um that I was really shown and I felt that as well. Um, okay. So I think that's all of the update and I'm just going to move on to what I was asked to share. It's actually kind of funny. So it's just like from a personal, uh, human standpoint, I just like woke up laughing because, um, um, this feels like it comes from, you know, I'm being divinely guided to, to do this, um, by Jesus. Um, and, uh, yet also it comes from my divine masculine. I just find it hysterical because, um, the, uh, passage of scripture that I'm going to read, um, to you is, um, first Corinthians chapter 15, which is a beautiful passage. Um, and it's, but it's right after, uh, it, it relates just to some past experiences, past, not of this lifetime experiences, um, and um, it's right after the chapter in this letter to the uh, to uh, the church at Corinth um, that Paul writes, where uh, he's essentially, you know, saying enough of this nonsense with speaking in tongues, and and it's all good, and I I do it, and um, um, and uh, let's keep things in order. <laughs> I just find it hilarious because oh, last week was you know when I was absolutely um, you know I couldn't I, I couldn't um, say no to that anymore because God had been you know directing me to um, to use that gift for quite some time and so um, anyway I just find that funny on a on a you know my own little process and that's so uh, true isn't it like um sometimes that's the thing we're working together always behind the scenes and um the divine partner is um you know and so what i woke up with was this guidance you know again it was it was also from the divine from you know absolutely from jesus and um but to share as a precursor to what i will later share about the ascension of jesus um at, toward the end of this month to go ahead and um you know kind of hit some key points of the story in a few videos and this one will be um on you know the resurrection and its meaning and um so what i woke up with was um you know that um 
it's my divine counterpart saying it's time to prophesy and um and i uh, you know it's so funny because that's what um you know is being talked about in these um scriptures that the value of um speaking um the uh truth of the resurrection and what that truly means um and so i will i will be sharing about that um Okay, enough of the personal. So moving into this, I'm going to read it and then I'll talk some about it. But know that before I begin reading, um, as I've said in other places, that it is the life of Jesus that is um, that Jesus, the person who, you know, walked and, you know, no, we don't know all the details of how that all unfolded. And there have been many um, omissions um, in the story. And um, and then there have been many um uh, where the the uh, truth of how it happened um, has been um, structured and altered in some cases, and otherwise uh, we don't know the whole of it. But in our hearts, <clears throat> we can you know we can feel um, the whole of it. And I do believe it is the life that Jesus came to teach us most of all. He came to show us the way. He was, you know, the divine blueprint, if you will. Um, and he often referred to himself as um, the son of man. And he was, um, in my view, a gift to humanity across all time. It was God's gift. And um, God being not an not merely um, some external being, but rather God, the very fabric of all life, the life force energy that is absolutely created every all that is, the source of all that is, the wellspring of who we are. And, and we are one with that God. There is no separation between us and God. There was a perceived separation, okay, because of our, uh, well, because of, you know, many things. I mean, the, the, the you know, generations of conditioning and the, the um, uh, interference um, of uh, those who would make us believe we are separate from God and so therefore must have all of, you know, this rigmarole of you must do this, 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 this in all re uh, religions, faith, um, traditions, um, and and not just faith, uh, it's culture too, right? Um, it's all kinds of control and manipulation that has been at play. But back to Jesus is Jesus and the Christ, uh, the Christ did uh, light that is in the world um, that remains and the person of Jesus are um, a um, forerunner in it, it, you know, and are um, something to look at in terms of what it does it mean to experience life, to have life and have it to the full. That is, in, in my view, the core teaching of Jesus. Um, and so, so Jesus um, died, was buried, and was resurrected, okay? So buried, um, you know, put in the tomb, and um, was, he was raised from the dead, okay? So it wasn't a magic trick. It wasn't a magic trick. Now, I do believe that much has been um, hidden in terms of the details of that, and I'm, I'm not going to address that here because I think that um, I just simply don't feel that I have the precise um, information to share, and I don't feel that that's relevant for what I'm here to share right now. But I do believe there's more to the story, I, and it doesn't really matter, though. It doesn't really matter how it all happened, or the, de the details do matter, but like the details do not matter as it is... Um, that we, it's what happened. God, again, not a being up in the sky, God raised him from the dead. He was raised. God raised him from the dead. All right, so um, let me read a chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. And this is Paul writing, and he says this. 
Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you take your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Cephas is another name for Peter. So, aside, Paul leaves out a little bit of an important part of the story, doesn't he? So, okay, I'm just going to go back. I'm just going to read it, and then I'll speak. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Fallen asleep, a term for died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the, the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me." Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you have believed. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of dead, the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we te have testified about God and that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Those Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom of God, the when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now he's quoting from scripture here. Uh, from the ancient scriptures. Um, now, when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Now, if there is no resurrection, then what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day, yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning, for there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish! What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another, and star differs from star in splendor. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. Let me say that again. The body that is sown is perishable. In other words, we die. It is raised imperishable. In other words, everlasting life. 
It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living, living being. The last Adam, meaning Christ, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. Let me read that again. The first man, Adam, became a living being, human. The last Adam, the, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth, and as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of, of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, humanity, so we shall we bear the image of the heavenly man, Jesus Christ raised. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. In other words, we will not all die, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immor immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So this is an argument that Paul is making. Paul had um, an amazing mind um, and did know the scriptures. He had studied them um, and also, uh, you know, in my, in my uh, uh, view of this, uh, that he absolutely did have the experience that he had on the road to Damascus where Jesus came um, and, you know, there was a flash of lightning or whatever and, um, and Jesus said, you know, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You know, and, um, and it was Jesus, and then Paul was blind for three days, and there was a series of events that uh, occurred. You can read about that in the book of Acts. So, uh, but even with his brilliance um, and, and his passion, so at this point he has complete, made a complete 180. And so now instead of persecuting the church with great fervor, uh, and doing a lot of damage and destruction, now he is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, um, and truly taking it to all the world and had a true deep passion for that. And so he has a, you know, a really deep understanding, um, and likes to study the ancient scriptures and also apply that to, um, the, um, in his time, the modern world. Um, and to, um, and so here he's giving us, um, he's writing to the, the church of, at Corinth, uh, with a specific purpose, um, to the people there because of, you know, what was being talked about there. And so that's, that's the reason this letter was written. And so he's, you know, he's saying, you know, um, I, I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because, you know, I persecuted the church. Um, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace was not without effect. So he's saying, I have already been changed from the inside out. And that, um, so this is what I believe. This is what we believe. And so he's, re, you know, kind of reminding the church at Corinth, this is what we believe. And we do believe in the resurrection of the dead. Um, and that's his point he's making. Um, but I really want to focus on, you know, some of this that he is saying, um, you know, 
here, like right here, if in verse 19, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are all of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So Christ was raised from the dead as all shall be raised from the dead. Now we can understand that literally um, if we would like to. Um, but I really think there's a larger story here, and I think Paul gets to it. He's getting to it. He's working it out, okay? Um, and perhaps he doesn't get quite to, to you know, to the, the fullness of the story, but he absolutely says the last enemy to be destroyed is death, and that Jesus will, you know, um, will essentially... Um, you know, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, after Jesus has come and done this, then, you know, he he will be returned, all will be restored to this, this order. And I think that this, what, what Paul is getting at, you know, I tell you a mystery. He doesn't quite, he's like, what is this? You know, he's still grappling with it, I think. And I think that's beautiful. That's how we all can be. Um, and that's how I love to approach scripture. Um, and I wanted to, to say that. But um, uh, by the way, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I say um am a lot and but and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I'm just not a good speaker, but I'm working on it. Um, but so Paul is saying here that all, you know, there are, there are, Various kinds of bodies in terms of life, right? Life. There are the and 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 that time it was very common too. We lost this along the way, thanks to to you know science in some ways, and then this just the just general belief in separation. But but in that at that time, you know, when Paul was writing, absolutely um, the, the the planets, the stars, everything was alive, right? And then the animals, the fish, the birds. Um, and the humans, and he's saying that all bodies, however, are different. Not all flesh is the same, verse 39, and, uh, but there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, okay? So life is in both, and uh, it's Im implicit here, I think, that, um, that, you know, there was an understanding that God created and that all that, in because in life we were all one and all connected. So then he turns to what I think is is a really beautiful explanation for again this time, and I think it is very accurate, and it is um, ties back to this idea that Christ shows us the way. Jesus came, Son of Man, fully human, fully divine, and showed us the way that that can be embodied. Okay, so the natural body physical form, and the embodiment of spirit. So Paul writes in verse 44, actually let me go back up to um, yeah, 40, and starting with the end of 42, the body that is sown is perishable. In other words, it's not going to last, human body. It is raised up, our human body is raised up imperishable. It is raised up and we are changed. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. The body is raised in glory. And, you know, think about this. Think about death, death, and the broader understanding of what death is. Death is decay. It can be described as um, a refusal of life, it, which is very consistent with the idea of sin, to miss the mark, to miss the point, to get off track, to deny ourselves, uh, to not see the fullness of who we are created to be, to not allow the Spirit to move through us. So Paul says, uh, he talks about Adam, uh, the first first man in the, in the story of Genesis, um, and then uh, by the way, I don't think that, um, I think that we assume that the uh, people in the early church, um, the founders of the church, and, and even in Jesus' times, the disciples, you know, somehow believed that there, um, Adam and Eve were in a garden, there were two people. Um, I don't necessarily think that was the way it, it happened at all. I think that's something that has been drilled into us to 
prop up this uh, this uh, theory of quote original sin that we were all evil, and that has that's a lie that has been told by the church and many 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 others affiliated with the systems of religion which are not, in my view, implied by the scripture at all. So, I, you know, I have, I have studied a bit, and there are plenty of people who have studied who disagree with me um, about that, but I would invite you to read the Bible yourself with a fresh, read it direct, um, and, and, and forget everything you've been told in terms of what um, somebody else's interpretation of that, and in, in particular, um, I think there's value in considering all, but but just you will know the truth. Allow the Spirit of God to reveal that to you as you read. Um, sorry, got to, I'm just on a roll today. I'm sorry. Um, so back to this passage that, so um, there are those who are of the earth and there are those who are of heaven. In other words, there are physical human beings um, walking the earth alive today and there are those who... Um, are in spirit form, no longer in the body. And just as we have been born in the er image of the earthly man, in other words, we are in those physical bodies walking around, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. We shall be spirit. And then Paul says, he talks about, in verse 51, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. We will not all die, but we will all be changed. And then Paul describes this about, you know, as in the terms that uh, were familiar in this time about, you know, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable. So the dead will be raised to new life and we will be changed. We will all be changed. Those in physical form, and those in uh, who have passed away, uh, whose bodies have, um, sorry, have perished. So when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, in other words, when this human body has been clothed with the spirit of the heavenly, uh, the, the, the spirit of God, the spirit of life, when it has been clothed with the imperishable, the everlasting, and the mortal, that which can die, with immortality, the everlasting life, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? See, it is death that we have been conditioned and taught that is inescapable, right? Right? There are even comedians who have made their entire um, their entire routine based on this uh, principle, which is widespread. It is a lot another lie we are fed over and over and over and over again. You know, we're only human. You know, you live, some crap happens, and then you die. <laughs> and it's uh, it's you know we have we have been succumbed to this belief that uh, we are one with death. We are one with sin. We are one with the law, what Paul describes as the law. But thanks be to God. God gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and, I, you know, what I would go further than Paul here, and I would say that thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Because in the person of Jesus, he has shown us the way of life. He has shown us that we can, in these human bodies that are perishable, we can clothe ourselves with the Spirit. We can open our hearts and we can allow the Spirit of God, the energy of life, to fill us and to raise us up. And there no longer needs to be the... Um, there no longer needs to be this limited perception, this doomsday or doom, uh, uh, doomed, we are all doomed kind of um, thinking about humanity. Humanity is something else because it has all been changed in Christ called the second Adam. It has all been changed. The last Adam, Jesus the Christ, 
is a life-giving spirit. God, through Christ, raises us up to new life. It is the gift of God that Jesus, the Christ, the one, the word, who was from the beginning with God and the word who was God, this Jesus Christ, fully human, fully divine, has come to show us that not only will there be a resurrection of the dead, as in the dead who have already perished and died, there is that resurrection in the life because Jesus said, I am the resurrection in the life and it is here and it is now. And we are invited to partake of this when we clothe ourselves with the spirit of God, when we open our hearts and when we see that there are all types of bodies, some, many of which uh, appear to be perishable, Okay, the heavenly bodies, the, the moon, the sun, the stars, the earthly bodies, humans, these dogs <laughs> that I'm taking care of, the birds that are chirping outside, the dolphins and the whales that are swimming in the seas. And through all of it runs the river of life. And that life is one with and sourced from spirit. And what appears to be perishable is, is actually being raised up. It's a process being raised up to new life. And when this process is complete, we are resurrected. So what happened in um, the early church was there was a um, a shift sort of that took root um, and it wasn't one person's uh, you know fault um, it was a lot of collusion just like how, how that happens in relationships or groups or systems um, in our time right it, it usually doesn't um, it happens with the silent complicity or active collusion of many many other players and typically it happens when a lot of people believe a lie that is fed to them because it's often dressed up real nice and presented as a solution or a way forward that is viable. So just, um, I think that there, you know, there was a, a turn that was taken by the early church where it's like the truths were all here all there uh, and being taught, but then it was interpreted in such a way or watered down in some cases or only a part of it um, was carried forward. And then there were a lot of uh, justifications for um, actions that were taken or for limited interpretations and or for um, Uh, for uh, political purposes in some, in some cases. And so, so what happened was the very thing that Paul is talking about here, the life, the resurrection, and that Jesus the Christ became a living being, um, as had Adam, but more importantly, became a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural in Adam, who was created, God created humanity. And then the spiritual, God raised up, showed how he was raising up humanity in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, the Christ. Just as we have born the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. And this is happening. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And at the twinkling of an eye, <laughs> what's time really, right? We're seeing time disappear. And this is the journey that we are on. We are being changed. So I will say more about this when I talk about the um, 
ascension story um, and the ascension of Jesus and read uh, share a little bit about that with you toward the end of this month. So for now, I just hope that you will um, consider these things and consider that this earthly body that we wear um, is not the whole of who we are and it itself is being raised up um, and we are absolutely transcending death, limitation, the belief in separation from each other, from God, and from life itself, from life itself. So allow life to flow through you. Allow life to be made manifest in you. And allow life to call you more and more to life, to God. Because life and light and love and God are one and the same. And you, you are one with that. So um, I'll leave it at that. Um, and thanks very much for listening if you have. And um, thank you for your um, for following um, these videos and just most of all, thank you for being present to your own journey. It's, it is indeed a mystery and a miracle.